All right, good day. Welcome to Chemical Calculations Part B, ILM 310303CB. Pure excitement all day today, so let's get at her. All right, this ILM uh, second one of Chemical Calculations deals specifically with uh, solutions and all kinds of math associated with solutions. Uh, as an instrument tech, it's likely that you will be required to maintain and calibrate liquid analyzers. Hopefully, you may have to mix your own calibration standards. Maybe, maybe not. Now, by performing solution calculations, you will be able to ensure that a proper standard is prepared. We'll describe concentrations of solutions and balance formulas for chemical reactions in this unit. So, by and large, this is all about setting you up for... Uh, being able to mix your own standard solutions uh, on site if you require that. Um, I understand uh, that most of the time you buy the standard solutions as you need them, uh, but there may be situations where you have something on the shelf, uh, but you need to make it into something else, and understanding the math behind that will be able to uh, facilitate you doing that. So our objectives today... Uh, we're going to talk about describing the concentrations of solutions in a whole bunch of different uh, terms. And then the second part of this ILM, which actually deviates quite a bit from the math, uh, is balancing formulas for chemical reactions. And this is uh, fundamental chemistry stuff. If you've done chemistry, uh, you would have done this already in, in uh, high school or maybe even sooner. Uh, but we look at balancing uh, chemical equations, which uh, should not be too bad. All right, so just some general stuff on solutions here, solution concentrations and definitions. A solution is a homogeneous mixture. Uh, if it wasn't homogeneous, of course, it would be heterogeneous. And what we mean by homogeneous, again, is that when we mix uh, the solute and the solvent together, you cannot really tell by the naked eye uh, that there is a couple of things in there. And that's kind of how we distinguish between homogeneous and heterogeneous, where you can visually tell that there's multiple things going on in there. Solutions, by definition, are made up of two components, the solute and the solvent. The solvent is usually the liquid in uh, greater proportion, and the solute is usually the component in the smaller uh, proportion. Okay, so solute here, definition substance being dissolved, and the solvent is usually present in a greater amount. So we take the solute, throw it in the solvent, and dissolve it, and we end up with a solution. We commonly think of solutions as, you know, a liquid and a solid, but solutions can happen in all different phases, as we can see in this little table, uh, where we have a long list of solutes and a long list of solvents and examples of types of solutions that are made using mixtures of those phases. So for example, if we took carbonation, uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, which is a gas, then we dissolved it in water, we end up with something called a carbonated drink. And most of us are familiar with many different types of carbonated drinks. Uh, liquid and liquid, for example, uh, antifreeze mixture is a solution, solids and liquids. So dissolving sugar and water is a, as a solution, uh, we can take oxygen and nitrogen and mix them together. We have air all around us and we can't tell the individual components. So that is a solution of gases uh, and we call that air. Liquids and solids in terms of uh, mercury and silver here, which is what they use for like dental amalgam. I'm not going to say I'm a dentist, but I think that's filling uh, material. And then we also have solid solutions. As you see here, if we mix zinc and copper, we get brass. If we have tin and copper, we get bronze. Um, they are uh, solid solutions. We melt them down, we combine them together, uh, and they become something else. In this case, different alloys. So alloys are technically solid solutions. So those are the different kinds of solutions uh, that are possible. And now we'll get into... Uh, discussing how we define uh, the strength or concentration of different solutions. So concentration is the amount of solute dissolved in a solvent. We look at it in two contexts, uh, a qualitative context and a quantitative context. So quality relates to the quality, good, bad, uh, strong, weak, that kind of thing. Uh, concentrated in or dilute are terms that are uh, common with solutions 
uh, and describing solutions, and then quantitative measures, uh, which will have some kind of a unit attached. And the ones that we're going to look at today uh, include mole fractions, molarity, normality, and parts per million. Uh, and this is um, some of this is a little bit more challenging than others. Uh, some of this builds up on some of the calculations we did in the first ILM, um, but it is, uh, it is mandated that we look at these different kinds of things here. So uh, we're going to look at basically the variations in, in concentration. So we have more solute in our solvents, it's of course, more concentrated than something that has less uh, solutes in our, in our solvent. So we'll look at that in terms of different qualitative and quantitative measures. So first one here is mole fraction, uh, probably the second easiest or easiest one to understand. Uh, based on what we've learned in the last ILM. Uh, and the mole fraction is the ratio of the components moles, as the name would imply, to the total, total number of the mixtures moles. Uh, this is used to measure the concentrations of gas mixtures. Uh, remember, gas mixtures are homogenous, meaning we can't differentiate components with the naked eye. And for representing the mole fraction, we use the Greek letter chi, or squiggly capital X to represent the mole fraction. And the mole fraction, again, is just the ratio uh, of a component's moles to the total number of moles of the mixture. So let's see what that looks like. So find the mole fraction of oxygen gas in a mixture that has a partial pressure of 150 torrs and a total pressure of uh, 750 torrs. Um, I don't know if you're like me, but before this ILM, I'd never even really heard of a tour before. It is just a pressure unit. Uh, don't worry about the unit itself. Uh, again, all we're doing here is finding out the ratio of oxygen. They're telling us we have a, uh, a contribution from the oxygen of 150 torr out of 750 torr. So again, that's just that ratio, that component A, which is oxygen at 150 out of the total pressure which is 750. So 150 over 750 is 0.2 or 20 percent. And that tells us our mole fraction for component A is 20 percent. It's always going to be less than one for a gas mix component, right? We're looking for the portion of the whole. So it's always going to be less than one. <coughs> Delving back into partial pressure again, uh, we've talked about this before in analyzers and we'll probably talk about it again. Uh, in chemistry and physics, there's something called Dalton's Law or Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures, uh, which describes what we just did in that previous math example that states, in a mixture of non-reacting gases, the total pressure exerted is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of the individual gases. Pretty straightforward. This law was observed by Dalton in 1801 and related to those ideal gas laws we talked about previously, the PV equals NRT. And long drawn out way of saying, uh, whatever's in the bottle, three atmospheres in this case, is the result of the sum of all the individual components in that bottle. So in this case, we have one atmosphere of oxygen and two atmospheres of nitrogen in this. We add them up together and we get a total of three atmospheres. I can figure out my, uh, my chi or my mole fraction by doing one over three for the oxygen and two over three for the nitrogen. So it's pretty, uh, pretty basic. Little flashback here on this slide for converting pressures, just in case you've uh, forgotten, not that this really matters too much. We generally uh, stick to the standard KPAs, um, but these are some of the conversions that you may have looked at back in, in first year. Um, in this ILM, the most common pressure units are atmospheres, tors, and KPA. Um, not anything here you really have to worry about. I'm not going to ask you to do really any of these conversions. Okay, here's a couple more examples here. Calculate chi or the mole component of oxygen if it has a partial pressure of 20.8 kPa's, just like it does in air and the total pressure is 99.1 kPa's. So again, using our formula, the mole fraction of the component, which is 20.8, and the mole, malaria, uh, total moles uh, of the whole solution, which is 99.1 kPa's, or the total pressure, sorry, of 
99.1 kPa is 20 over 99.1 is 0.21 or 21% is G. So again, I'm pretty straightforward here. Uh, last but not least here, uh, in nitrogen in air is 0 0.7808 or air is 78% nitrogen is what we're saying here. Calculate the partial pressure of nitrogen if the atmospheric pressure is 14.7 PSIA. So all we got to do here is uh, flip this formula around a little bit and all we're saying that air is 70, uh, nitrogen is 78% of air. So basically it's going to be 78% of this 14.7 PSIA. So we're just extrapolating the formula here a little bit and flipping it around here, 14.7 uh, times 0 0.7808 gives us 11.5 PSI. So that's what nitrogen makes up uh, in this particular mixture, 78%. So that's the easiest of the, of the math so far. Uh, the next one here is molarity, and it's a little bit trickier, but uh, this builds on what we learned last ILM when we were talking about moles. And it builds on that. So molarity units is the measure of a concentration of a solute in a solution. And this red statement here is probably the most helpful thing that I can mention throughout this entire ILM. All of the stuff that we're doing today in terms of this math is just some type of a ratio, uh, one way or the other. Um, we make it a little bit more challenging by changing the volumes uh, of things, but uh, the long story short, and specifically when we're talking about molarity, is that it is the number of moles of a solute per liter of solution. So in a worst case scenario, you kind of step back and you, and you look at your math in terms of one liter, regardless of what the question says, if the question is 250 milliliters or two liters or 500 milliliters, whatever it is, if you understand the concept that it is the number of moles in a liter, you can make some general uh, lo logistical decisions just in your head that will kind of point you towards the right direction. I'm, hopefully, I'll be able to illustrate that as we give you a couple of examples here again anyway. So molarity, big M, is simply the moles of a solute in a liter of a solution and or some variation of, of this. Uh, might not be a liter, might not be a mole, but it is the relationship between the number of moles and the amount or volume uh, involved. So here's what a standard question kind of looks like. Uh, and this one takes 250 milliliters instead of a liter. So hopefully this will give you an example of what I mean by think of it in a liter and then work your way away from it. So calculate the concentration of a 250 milliliter solution that contains 10.6 grams of copper bromate or bromide. The molar mass of copper bromide is 223.35 grams per mole. So you have to ask yourself, what can I figure out with the information that I've uh, been given here? I have a certain mass of this copper bromate, and I know that one mole of it weighs this much, so I can figure out how many moles I actually have. I don't have a whole mole, obviously, that's 223 grams. I have 10 grams, so that's like 10.5% of a mole or, or something like that. So let's run that math out here. 10.6 uh, grams out of 230 or 223.35 grams tells us that I have 0 0.04745 moles of this copper bromate by mass. That's what I've got, 0.475 moles. So here's where I tell you if I was to take this 0 0.04745 moles and I throw it into a liter of solution, my molarity for that liter of solution is going to be 0 0.04745. That's what it's going to be. But if I put it into 250 milliliters, one quarter of the water, what's going to happen? Is it going to be more diluted? Or is it going to be more concentrated? If I'm taking the same mass of solute and I'm putting it in less of a solvent, it's going to be more concentrated. And in this case, it's going to be more concentrated by a factor of four. The math and the ILM will walk you through how you do that, but I like to just kind of work it through logically. So in this case, I can find the molarity using the formula now. 
0.04745 moles in 250 milliliters, oops, sorry, or 0.25 liters. And that tells me that one molarity for that volume of fluid is 0.1898 or four times this because I'm putting it into less liquid so it is more concentrated. And that's what you have to look for in, in the math as we go forward here. Uh, if you can relate to it in one liter, so if I put it in one liter, this is what it's going to be. If I put it in less, it's going to be more concentrated. If I put it in more, it's going to be less concentrated. Uh, and that gets you kind of going in the right direction. Standard solutions. Um, so as far as chemistry goes for us as instrument techs, this is one of the most practical applications that you might encounter on a job. Uh, liquid analyzers use uh, calibration standards in order to uh, maintain and test them. Usually we buy them pre-made. Uh, but sometimes it's required for us to mix our own solutions uh, and we do this by adding a mass of a solute or some chemical to a volume of some solvent, usually water. So in this case here, we're taking uh, 30 grams of salt, adding it to 100 grams of water, and then we're making a solution. Uh, this is, this, I don't know why I have this picture here to be uh, honest with you, maybe just a little bit more information. Uh, so they're saying if I add 30 grams of salt to 100 mils of water, uh, it will all dissolve. You won't be able to see any salt anywhere here in it at all. And we call that an unsaturated solution. And that just means that it could take more uh, before coming saturated. And then we show you the second example where I'm putting 40 grams uh, of salt into the same volume of water and I stir it all up. And you'll notice that there is some salt laying on the bottom of the beaker here. Uh, the reason that the salt is laying on the bottom of the beaker here is because the water has dissolved as much salt as it possibly can. It can't dissolve anymore. Uh, it has become saturated and the excess is settling on, on the bottom. So that's just kind of general, general knowledge there. Okay, so standard solution example number two. Um, typical example here, calculate the mass of uh, sodium sulfate you would need to prepare one liter of a three molarity solution of this stuff in water. Again, using the same formula, the moles of solute per liter of solution and figure out what you can, you can determine uh, using the formula here. So the atomic mass of sodium sulfate, we run out the numbers, two sodiums, one sulfur, four oxygens, is 142.65 grams. So if I took that one mole or 142 grams and I put it in a liter, I would have a one molarity concentration solution. But I need a three molarity concentration solution. So how do I get that? Easy. I just add three times this mass to a liter of water. So 426 grams to a liter of water and we're done. I could also go the other direction and say I need a 1.5 molarity uh, solution or a 0.5 molarity solution or a 0.25 molarity solution. And again, it's just a ratio of the solute to the solution. So try not to overcomplicate things as you move forward. Uh, again, mixing chemicals can be dangerous and painful. So make sure you wear the proper PPE, gloves, face masks, et cetera, et cetera. All right, here's where we start taking a little bit of the plunge into the deep end. Uh, we talked about something called normality. And normality is a specific chemistry uh, type of thing. And you probably never see this again after the course, um, but general background knowledge here. So what is normality? And try not to put too much weight on the uh, definition here. It is a little tough to understand here. By definition, normality is the number of a solute's equivalents that are in a liter of solution. Basically, they are used to determine the concentrations of acids and bases, and they represent the amount of a compound needed in order to provide the required number of hydronium or hydroxide ions to the solution. This ties in really heavy to pH analyzer measurement, basically. And it has to do with knowing how much hydroxide do I have to put into an acid to neutralize it, or how much hydronium do I have to add to water in order to make it a, an acid that I'm 
looking for. Where we get the hydronium and where we get the hydroxide is kind of where normality comes from. We, uh, in a perfect world, we just get straight pure hydronium or straight pure hydroxide, but it doesn't usually work that way. We usually get them from some other compound and they're just living inside some other compound. Uh, and that's what normality is really speaking to. So if that description helps a little bit, um, I hope it does. So normality N here is the equivalence of a solute. So we'll talk about the equivalence of a solute in a liter of a solution. So nothing massively different here in the in the formula except for this word equivalence here. And we'll talk about where these equivalents comes down, come from. Okay, so again, speaking specifically with uh, acids and bases, uh, there is a separate formula for each. So the acid equivalence factor is the number of equivalents of hydronium in a mole of acid. And the base equivalence factor is the number of equivalents of hydroxide in a mole of base. Probably more confused now than, uh, than ever, um, but hopefully uh, we can look at the example here uh, and it'll bring some light to the situation. Okay, so here's an example. Phos phosphoric acid has the chemical formula of H3PO4, which looking at this recipe tells us that in one mole of phosphoric acid, I have three moles of hydrogen. Thus, its equivalency is three. Does that sound too simple? Because that's what it is. This is what equivalence means. It means that in one of these, there's three hydrogens, so its equivalence factor is three. So in one mole of this phosphoric acid solution, there are three moles of hydrogen and its normality is three, meaning that one mole of this can contribute three moles of this. Long and painful, I understand, but it's, uh, this, is the way, this is the way that it works. Okay, so let's see how this looks. And this is, uh, this is almost as bad as it gets. Uh, calculate the normality of a phosphoric acid solution containing 284 grams in one liter of solution in reactions that replace all three hydrogen or hydronium ions. So the words are the worst part of uh, this section is understanding what's going on in terms of the question. So let's look at this here. Uh, first, we're going to find out we have 284 grams. How many moles do we have? So we take the mass we have by the molar mass of phosphoric acid, which in this case is 98 grams per mole, divide that into 284, and it tells us that we have 2.897 moles of H3PO4. Inside of every one of these H3PO4s, I have three hydroniums or hydrogens. So that means our equivalency or normality is three. So then we multiply that number by three. So 2.87 times three gives us 8.69. That's how many moles of this we actually have in the mass of H3PO4 that we have. And now we divide it by the volume. So 8.69 in one liter gives us a normality of 8.69 H3PO4. Long and painful, but again, the question is probably worse than, than the math here, um, but all we're doing is defining a ratio of the number of hydrogens in a compound or the number of hydroxides in a compound. So this is the way I like to do it. This is the way I, the ILM likes to do it. Pick your, pick your poison. Um, but again, English is probably the most complicated part of this section. Second example here, uh, calculate the number of grams of sulfuric acid with the formula H2SO4. So if I asked you what the equivalence is for sulfuric acid, you can look at it and go, well, in one of these, there's two of those. So its equivalence uh, is two or normality is two. Uh, number of grams of this necessary to prepare 500 mils of a 0.1 normality H2SO4 solution in reactions that replace both hydrogen ions. So very painful reading, I admit. 
So first thing we're going to do is convert uh, our milliliters to liters. So 500 milliliters is 0.5 liters. Then we are going to multiply the volume by the molarity. So our volume 0.5 liters times our uh, uh, molarity or 0.1, which is right here, gives us a 0 0.05 normality. And then we're going to apply the equivalence factor. Um, for this, it is going to be uh, 1 over 2 or 0.5 because we're uh, we're only using a half a liter in this case, which tells us that we have 0 0.025 moles. And then we convert from moles to grams, our 98.1 grams per mole times 0 0.025 tells us that we need 2.45 grams of H2SO4 in order to create 500 milliliters of a 0.1N solution. And I don't have anything I can say except for story um that's that's the way it goes um again long story short if you were to look at this in terms uh, of liters if i turn this into a liter for example and i wanted a 0.1 normality i would take the molar mass of h2so4 uh what is it 98.1 grams if i put 98.1 grams of this into a liter i would have a normality of one so if i put 9.8 grams of it in a liter, I would have a normality of 0 0.01. That gets me halfway there. But I'm putting it into 500 milliliters, so I'll need, again, half, uh, half of that again. So that gets us down to 4.5 something or other. And then we have to add the equivalence, meaning that there's two of these in every one of these, so that halves it again which gets us down to 2.45 grams. So depending on how your brain works, uh, you can work it out that way based off of a liter and then kind of work your way around it. I don't know if that works for you or not, but that's the way my brain kind of works. All right, so moving away from what is probably the most brain cramping section into something a little bit uh, easier to wrap our heads around, uh, parts per million. So parts per million is pretty self-explanatory. One part in a million is a part per million. Okay, we use parts per million, so we don't have to use really small molarity numbers. So like 0 0.001 molarity, we don't really want to use that. So we just switch over to parts per million. Uh, it's useful for us. Uh, we, uh, we use parts per million and parts per billion quite a bit in analyzers. Um, and again, this is largely so that we don't have to use large decimal numbers at work. We can just call it a part per million. Uh, instead. So a part per million by definition is one part of a solute in a million parts of a solution or 10 to the six parts of a solution. It's the fractional amount of a solute in a solution multiplied by a million. And it's not just that easy. There are three different types of parts per million and we'll look at them individually. It is mass per mass, mass per volume, and volume per volume. And they're all very, uh, very closely related, uh, and this should be uh, far less stressful on the brain than the previous uh, section was. So let's look at mass per mass, and they're easy to identify uh, because of the units that will be attached to them. So mass per mass, you're going to have some type of mass measurement here. So parts per million when we're talking about mass, mass here is a gram of solute over grams of solution times 10 to the sixth. That's how you find it, or an easier way to find it is a one milligram of a solute in one kilogram of a solution. So this is a thousand, and this is one thousand. And if we counted decimal places, we go one, two, three, four, five, six. That's six decimal places. That tells us that it's parts per million. So this is an easy way to remember it when you're doing mass per mass parts per million calculations. It's milligrams of solute per kilogram uh, of solution. Mass per volume, mass unit on top, volume unit on the bottom. Again, grams per milliliter is the direct ratio times 10 to the 6 to get it to parts per million. Or the easier cheap version is a milligram of solute in a liter of solution. Again, a liter is 1,000 millimeters on the positive side. A milligram is a thousand on the 
negative side or the decimal side, so the, there's six spaces between them, and that's how you get the parts per million. And last but not least, uh, volume per volume. So again, volume unit on top, volume unit on the bottom, and in this case, there's no fancy cheat method on this one here. Uh, it is simply milliliters over milliliters times 10 to the sixth. So let's do a couple of examples. What is the mass in grams of uh, HCl that you need to make one liter of 100 parts per million mass per volume solution? So we want to make one liter. We take our grams or milliliters and multiply it by 10 to the six, or we do the easy version, which is milligrams of solute in liters of solution. So here we have um, 100 ppms or 100 milligrams is going to be in one liter of solution. That represents 100 ppms. <clears throat> that's, that's the easy that's the easy way to do it. It's simple. 100 ppms is simply how many milligrams in a liter. I'm using one liter. I need 100 milligrams. Simple, and it's basically uh, basically done that. So 0.1 grams or 100 milligrams. Uh, my version using a shortcut or the ILM's version of doing all these fancy upside down conversions. Next example here, what volume of a solution do you need to make a 50 ppm mass per volume sodium hydroxide solution using 0.4 grams of sodium hydroxide? Given that 50 ppm is going to be 50 milligrams in one liter, here I have how many milligrams? 400 milligrams. So if I have 400 milligrams of sodium hydroxide, make it easy, 400 divided by 50 is 8 liters. So I add that to 8 liters and I will get a 50 ppm solution. So again, the English is more complicated than the math, or at least I think it is. Okay, shift out of whatever gear that you're in there now, flip it into neutral for a second, drop her down a second. Uh, things get a little bit better here moving forward into the next objective, which is balancing uh, formulas. So we're going to learn how to balance chemical formula after a reaction has occurred. And the chemical reaction uh, is an equation that represents the change with symbols and formulas. The reactants are the substances before the chemical change occurs, and they're on the left-hand side of the formula. And the product is what the reactants are changed into after a reaction, and they are on the right-hand side of the formula. So when we write the formula for the reaction, uh, it looks like that. We've done this many times, reactants over here, an arrow showing that something has happened, and then new products. The addition sign is used to show the combination of elements in the formula, so the old addition sign here. And in this example, we're taking methane, and we're adding some oxygen to it, and this is a combustion reaction generating carbon dioxide and water. And you can notice that this is a balanced equation which means that it has the same number of elements on either side. How do we know? <coughs> Excuse me, we count. There's no easy way to do it. One carbon here, one carbon here. Four hydrogens here. Two times two is four hydrogens here. Two times two oxygens is four oxygens here. Two oxygens here. And two times one oxygen is two oxygens here. So there's four on this side. Or on this side, everything balances. That is balancing an equation. How do we do it? Well, there's lots of ways to do it, but trial and error is generally the way it works. So how balancing works is based on this law of conservation of mass, which states that matter is neither created nor destroyed. It is only changed in a reaction. If we look at this over here, uh, I have equal numbers of all the different elements here. I have equal numbers of all the different elements here. If I broke it out and I weighed all of this, 12.01, 4 times 1.01, .01, and 4 times 16, I'll get some mass. I'll do the same thing over here. I'll get some mass, and lo and behold, it'll be the same mass, but the things are different. So nothing is 
destroyed. It's just turned into something new. Wonderful, right? All right, so let's look at a reaction with iron and hydrochloric acid. Here I have iron, the solid, drop it into a beaker full of hydrochloric acid. What happens? I end up getting iron chloride and hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas is given off in the reaction. You can see that as it starts to eat away the iron. And this is an example of an unbalanced equation. How do we know it's unbalanced? Easy. We count one iron, one iron. Perfect. One hydrogen, two hydrogens. Uh-oh. One chlorine, two chlorines. Uh-oh. So that's not balanced. How do we balance it? We put some coefficient in front of something in order to make it balance. So in this case, by putting a two in front of the HCl, this puts now two hydrogens here, which coincides with the two here. It also makes two chlorines, which go in, goes with the two chlorines here. In a perfect world, they would all be this way. Uh, but often what happens is if you put a number in here, sometimes it'll change what happens to other things. So that's what you'll have to look out for as you go balancing. Again, you can plunk random numbers in here all day and eventually you'll get an answer. Um, but there are some rules that we can use to make this a little bit easier. So in this case, we added the two and it made everything balanced. But it's not always that easy. So there's three helpful rules that we use for balancing. First one is balance the most complex compounds first and single elements last. The second rule is don't break up any polyatomic ions. So SO4, PO4, NH3, OH, all of those things from the polyatomic ion table that you have on your periodic tables. Uh, try not to break them up. And the third rule, write water as HOH when you're balancing hydroxides. So if you have a chemical equation that has a hydroxide compound in it and also has uh, water written as H2O in the same formula, you will probably find it easier to uh, scribble out the H2O and rewrite it as HOH. And there'll be an example coming up here that will show you uh, each of these rules. Um, I did make another video uh, on this yesterday uh, where I walk through all the examples with my fancy uh, pen and, and do the math live. So there's a video on Blackboard called uh, Balancing Equations Examples that you can look at afterwards if you're having any, any trouble with this. All right, so here's an example. Uh, calcium hydroxide plus uh, phosphoric acid yields this and HOH. So this is the same thing as writing H2O. So first thing you're going to do is look for what looks to be the most complicated thing going on here. And I'm going to say that it's probably this CA3PO4. So I'm going to start out by balancing uh, this guy out here. Um, this is going to be very difficult for me to do without a, without a pen on the screen. So I actually might just bail out here and make you guys watch that other, uh, that other video because uh, it makes things a little bit easier. But let's, let's just see what we can do here. So here I have three calciums. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to write a three. That's going to get three calciums over here. That'll match that over here. That also is going to end up multiplying everything else here. So I have two phosphates over here. I have one, uh, one phosphate over here. So I could put a two in here. That is going to make my phosphates happy, but then it's going to change my number of hydrogens. I'm going to have two times three or six hydrogens over here. Here I only have one, so I'll have to put a six over here. That will make my hydrogens balance. I put a six over here to make my hydrogens match. Well, I'm also going to end up with six hydroxides. Over here, I only have two. So that three that I put there earlier is going to help. So basically, that's kind of what you have to do. Uh, I'll just, without having actually done them here, I'll just work through how the rules kind of help you out. So next one here, uh, this is a combustion reaction. In the video, I call this methane, and it's a mistake. It's actually butane. Uh, but long story short, we're just going to balance it again here. So again, look for the most confusing one. In this case, looks like C4H10, and try to try to balance that out. So four carbons here, one carbon over here. So I'll write a four in that spot. 
Okay, then I have 10 hydrogens over here and I only have two over here. So I'd write a five in this spot. So now I have 10 hydrogens here. I also have 10 oxygens here, over here. I only have two oxygens. So I can fix that by putting a five right there. So now I have a zero, a five, a four, and a five. So if I was to go through this, and I apologize for not having my pen, um, you would probably find that this balances. Okay, another last, another example here, not the last example, but again, uh, this one, this one is unique, uh, mainly because of this O3. Uh, and if you watch the video, you will find out that oxygen in an odd number causes problems. So looking at what looks most complicated here is this iron uh, chromate uh, combination. So I'll start balancing, I'll start balancing out here probably. So I have one iron here, over here I have two. So I'll start out by putting a two over here. That'll change that. That'll mean I have two times two for chromium, uh, which is four chromiums. Here I only have one. So I'm gonna put a four over here. That'll make four chromiums. That'll also change this from two potassiums into four times two or eight. So I'll do the same thing over here. I'll put a four over here. That'll change my carbons from one uh, one to four, so that means I have to change this to four. Anyway, what you'll find out is you can balance out, you'll be able to balance out the iron, you'll be able to balance out the chromium, you'll be able to balance out the potassium, you'll be able to balance out the carbon, and then you'll be left with oxygen. So you count up the number of oxygens on each side. So as we sit here without our coefficients, we have four oxygens here, three oxygens here, and two oxygens here, so three, seven, nine. So I'd have nine on this side. On this side, I'll have four, three is seven, and this is also nine, bad example. Um, the idea is you want them to balance. If I had the coefficients in here, they wouldn't, they wouldn't balance out. I would have uh, an even number. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. I think it's 26 or something over here, and I end up with uh, 23 or something over here. Uh, when you have a difference in oxygens, one side is odd, the other side is even. A simple trick to do is to double all of your coefficients. And again, if I was doing this live, I believe um, I believe that I start out with two here, and a four here, and a four here, and a four here, and I end up with an imbalance of my oxygen. Everything else balances, but my oxygens don't. So what you have to do is you go back and you take everything that you've got in here for a coefficient, my two, four, four, and four, and you double them all. So this becomes four, eight, eight, and eight. Oops. And what you, oh my God. And then what you do by doubling everything is you're turning this odd number into an even number. And then you can adjust this oxygen in order to make it match. That's I, I'm, I apologize that uh, I can't do these here on the screen for you. Okay, moving to this one here. I, this is an easy one here. Uh, most complicated thing is this ammonia. Two ammonias here, one over here. So I'm going to put a two over there. That balances my ammonia. Now that gives me also two chlorines here. Wow, there's two here already. So that's awesome. So there's one carbonate. There's one carbonate, one barium, one barium. So this one is balanced. Uh, all I have to do is put a two right here and this formula becomes balanced and if i was asking you what the coefficients were uh, on an exam a multiple choice exam this would be a one a one a one and a two so it'd be written in one comma one comma one two would be the answer on a test okay this is uh last example i believe uh, and this one speaks to lip specifically to rule number three, that hydroxide one. So here we have iron, uh, iron three hydroxide, and this is written as hydroxide, and this is written as H2O. So this is the one where, the, where we would say if you have hydroxide in the formula somewhere, and you have water written this way, to change it to HOH, and that will make the balancing uh, much easier here. So uh, again, that would be the first thing I do on this one, and then I'd look for the most complicated compound. In this case, SO4-3. Uh, uh, I have three SO4s here. I have one of them here, so I'm going to put a three 
over here that straightens uh, that straightens those out, but then turns this into six hydrogens. So then I'm going to put a three over here, uh, which makes my hydrogens uh, six. But you're going to see that I'm going to get a problem because if I put a three here, that's going to make three oxygens, which is going to give us an odd number issue. So this is going to be one of those ones we're going to end up doubling all our coefficients once once we're done. So uh, I would encourage you to watch the other video I recorded yesterday uh, to help you through these examples if you find them uh, a struggle moving forward. So that's it uh, for today's uh, lecture. Um, not much else to uh, say there, but uh, just to show you uh, here in recordings, uh, balancing equations demo here is where I walk through uh, those five examples for you guys as well. I also got some questions about where can I find uh, older recordings. Uh, you see that there's two pages of recordings here, but there's stuff that's missing. Uh, if you need to find something that's missing, you'll have to come over here uh, to recent recordings, go to recordings and arrange uh, and enter a range from like the beginning of the course, call it March 1st to now, and now you'll see down here, I've got pages of recordings, so you can go back in history to look at them. All right, that is 